is psychedelics demand of us courage. Every single person who says they've done psychedelics several dozen times is a courageous person. You're standing in the presence of fearlessness because otherwise people turn away from it. And I think courage is probably a good value, probably makes you a good person to hike in the woods with or have an affair with or whatever. So it makes us courageous and it dissolves boundaries which let in love or fear. And the fear that they let in can be transformed in the psychedelic state through an inner alchemy into love. That's why, you know, the most dramatic personality transformations I've ever seen, including my own, have been psychedelically induced and just happen on the dime. You know, you go into it person A and 12 hours later you come out and you are not that. It doesn't always work like that. I mean, that's, but nothing else ever works like that. gentlemen. Alan, it's a possibility, isn't it? The very word secrecy is repugnant Secrets. in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically Wake opposed up. to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers constant extreme danger which are cited to justify it even today there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restriction even today there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it and there is very grave danger extreme danger that an announced need for increased security. This is Conspiracy Queries with Alan Carr. Will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. You're crazy. And no official, high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, Cover up our mistake. Isn't the Pentagon suspicious that all of building would blow up? Or to withhold from the press and the public. I think you're just looking at things for the first time. The facts they deserve to know. You've had your whole fucking life to think things over. What good's a few minutes more gonna do you now? The facts they deserve to know. They deserve to know. Deserve to know. Oh boy, Green Crush. Deserve to know. Green Crush conspiracy queries. Yeah. Green Crush Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park is what I meant to say. And what I meant to mean 
And I'm excited because we have a guest. The guest didn't need to cancel. And they're here in the studio. I mean, that's the big trifecta. <laughs> this is episodes 127 and 55 of Green Crush Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. The green is the cannabis. Crush is what you do uh, with the obstacles on your pathway to health. Ooh, there's the raven. I've outsmarted the raven. I've been able to do that uh, for some time now, and I continue to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy always cuts me off when I get to that part. Uh, I am raising my fist. Thank you anyway. Um, yeah, this is great. We do have a fantastic show with a real-life person on uh, as an author. He's an author, folks. I'm going to tell you exactly who it is in a couple of seconds because uh, I'm savoring the moment. This is very exciting for me. Uh, that this gentleman is here with us today. He's an experienced uh, individual. That is for sure. So, uh, And, of course, relating to uh, all things cannabis, his past, uh, much different from his present. <laughs> cannabis is a completely different chapter in this gentleman's life. I'll tell you about him in a second. Um, what's the green in Green Crush? That's the thing you need to know next. The green in Green Crush, of course, is the cannabis. And what cannabis can do to those obstacles. And I am the Alan Park who discovered this madness for my own self as a result of my terminal diagnosis. In this corner, aggressive advanced stage 4 prostate cancer already metastasized with a 10 to 12 month guaranteed death sentence from one of Canada's highest regarded prostate surgeons. Ooh, who's in the other corner? And in the green trunks, he didn't even know he was wearing an unemployed man in agony with no scientific knowledge. Uh, that was the fight. That's how it teed up uh, uh, anyhow. And um, guess what? I'm sitting here right now in the Pacific Junction Hotel, 234 King Street East. We are an eggplant digital media creation. Eggplant digital media. Innovative and exciting digital media. You know, there's some that isn't. Anyway, we aren't that. We have all kinds of good shows. Come hang with us here at the Pacific Junction Hotel that I mentioned. 234 King Street East in Toronto's downtown. So our guest today is the man who wrote this book. We see that on the... Are we getting that? Is that... Am I... Have I ever been? Yes. Uh, this is uh, written by, this is a book called High, and yes, that is a joint, um, as the letter I in there. From the pot father, Brian O'Day is here, gracing us with his presence. Um, <laughs> he's an encyclopedia. He's experienced uh, both cannabis, the wonders of it, uh, the profits from it, and the uh, penalties that come if you did that the wrong way around back in the day, which he did. So he's here to talk to us about it. And um, it, it's kind of uh, interesting to get to the bottom of a lot of uh, the stories. He's a, also a great uh, storyteller. Um, and a lot of those stories are in and about prison. And I'm sure the authorities uh, would prefer him there at the time. But, but he's out. He's been out for a long time and turned his life in a completely different direction, but still aware uh, of his past and its background. Okay, so uh, he, he was a man who used as a tool of his job a false bottomed suitcase, among other things. Plane rides over the Pacific in a plane with a failing engine, probably carrying stuff he wasn't supposed to have. We're going to hear about these kinds of things and more. And we'll also get Brian's take on uh, the, current, uh, the current times in Canada where we, um, where we are just about to merge into uh, Justin Trudeau's little plan. We'll find out from Brian what he thinks of it. Uh, prison was, you know, where Brian, I guess, uh, collated his awarenesses and not much to do. He wrote them down and released the book um, of his autobiographical account detailing a history filled with this excitement, this unbelievable series of events, and all told by a true storyteller, which makes it easy, um, easier uh, to be able to tell that stuff, you know, to have some kind of uh, performance capability. Of course, he parlayed that later into television production. We'll talk about that and what he's doing now. We'll talk about that. But I also want to say that I had a great time at the Hemp and Cannabis Expo on the weekend. Very fun time uh, at that place and with those people. 
let me tell you that Beth was wonderful, and she facilitated two one-hour talks there for uh, both Green Crush stalwart Paul Hartman and myself. Uh, Paul's innate and acquired knowledge of this plant also astounds me. All of its horticultural aspects, um, just incredible. Uh, and Paul is also very well uh, representing Grow Light, G R O L Y T, Grow Light. And if you grow, and you really should, you you should grow your yield with Grow Light. Um, Paul's talked about why that is. First of all, it's the best light on the planet. Second of all, it's the cheapest light to run on the planet. Uh, very heavy duty, and uh, there's no way you're going to burn anything. You can um, you can use this thing down on a wooden table, and it's not going to heat it up. It's just an incredible uh, spectrum powered uh, light that you really want to find out more about. And I also had stage time this weekend, and I feel like I might have done a few more things right in the first speech on the Saturday than I had imagined I might do, given the results. Uh, but for now, I will remain silent on who asked me to do what, based on my talk last weekend, but it is very good news. And when I can share it, I will. Okay, so... Um, that's that's a little bit of business I needed to get out of the way. And now let's move on to... Oh, we got a whole bunch of stuff today, man. This is this is a uh, chock-full day. I guess things are getting a little nuts with the... Um, yeah, they must be stopped, right? Yeah, I know. Double load, double load today. Okay, so let's get to the double load. Oh, boy. All right. Um, here we go. What happened over the weekend at the Hampton Cannabis Expo, Expo was indeed uh, wonderful and uh, put us uh, in a mind that, you know, this is a fantastic country we, we live in. These people were all from Western Canada. Uh, the presenters, Hampton Cannabis Expo, and I'm pretty sure almost everybody as uh, an exhibitor was also um, from out west, Western Canada, showing us what they have, and they have some really fine products. Of course, Western Canada, the home of Vancouver Island and all the other islands. There's a lot of great things going on in there. A lot of horticulture going on in there. But um, we're going uh, <laughs> to get to that later on. I just wanted to say thanks very much again. And thanks for providing me with uh, a place to speak. Speaking of speaking, at the beginning of the show, Terrence McKenna... Uh, I, I used to just play comments of his regarding cannabis, and then um, there's only so much of that material from a man no longer with us. And so I started running psilocybin or psilocybin clips, uh, mind expansion. It's all the same thing. So we will be going to mushrooms later. I could be launching this show in a couple of years from now and calling it Cap Crush or Mushroom Crush or something for the same reason I needed to start this show. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and we're kind of bleeding into it by talking about using psychedelic mushrooms. Now, why would we do this? Well, if you go online to the uh, online library uh, dot wiley dot com and find out about human brain mapping, you'll understand that enhanced repertoire of brain dynamical states occur during the psychedelic experience. So you're using your brain in such a way that you don't normally use it. Uh, this study of rapid changes in brain dynamics and functional connectivity. FC uh, is of increasing interest in neuroimaging. That was the weirdest uh I might have ever made. Even I thought it sounded odd when I heard it come out of my mouth. Uh, uh. Okay. So brain states departing from normal waking consciousness are expected to be accompanied by alterations in the aforementioned dynamics. In particular, the psychedelic experience produced by psilocybin, a substance found in magic mushrooms, is characterized by unconstrained cognition and profound alterations in the perception of time, space, and selfhood. None of these things are in a place where anyone in government should tell you that you're not allowed to do this, by the way. And I know that's different in some countries than others. I know some are far more liberal. I know some countries put people to death for smoking a joint or definitely trying a mushroom. The Chinese put people to death for Falun Gong meditation. And all of the reasons for this is that the more you get into these um, elevated states, as my deep-throated friend says at every theme song, um, you, you, um, you, you do develop another state of consciousness. It just does so happen. It's not weird. It's like saying if you work out your biceps and do a bunch of curls, they'll get bigger. It's not strange. It's the same kind of thing. 
And um, it's wonderful that these other chemicals uh, that we do have access to uh, can do that, but the authorities don't like it. Uh, and it's not because they're worried about your health. It's worried about their health. Um, it's worried about its health, as we all understand the bullshit structure that they surround themselves with uh, to lord over ourselves to lord over our lives with their nonsense especially when the science is uh, is starting to show uh even the most ardent resistors uh that it is uh, a fantastic um option uh to study these things that have been walled off by the authorities as dangerous this is just not a a, a good idea at all to leave those when we need them to advance as a species and if you've taken a look around at the news lately uh, clearly we're going in the wrong direction as far as advancing as a species, is concerned. Uh, so, so I don't know why anybody would think other than to uh, investigate these fantastic benefits that are available once you understand what is available to be worked with and you take into consideration the downside. Whoever thought it would be legal to jump out of a plane? Uh, it's dangerous. You could fall and die out of a plane. You could you could have a heart attack from the rush of it. You could do all kinds of things and have all kinds of problems. Uh, maybe your suit isn't on properly, and maybe you experience a, a, a chafing, a burning that you can't even believe when the parachute engages. Maybe they didn't set the parachute up properly. All of those things can happen, uh, but of course they bother to train themselves and the people that use them and fold them properly and there are certain ways to do certain allegedly dangerous things and I'm kind of done listening to government telling me uh, they think incorrectly something's dangerous fully and it isn't and then they tell us we can't use it really nonsense uh, they don't really have a lot of the science in at all uh, and if they do and if it's in our favor um, they ignore that particular uh, aspect which is really uh, kind of crummy, but um, <laughs> we do have uh, we do have a couple of police yeah, stories here. This is cops or truth. Right. So the um, as I mentioned before, we have the uh, the police are going to be rolling out these Draeger five thousand blood testing units that are going to be a big problem for everybody in Canada because now our rights are being infringed by this artificial testing device that's not really one hundred percent anywhere near one hundred percent efficient. Ottawa knows that, so their police department is rejecting the roadside cannabis test kits, which means if you live in Ottawa, you're subject to less scrutiny than anyone else that is in a community that is taking these tests. So right away, there's no uh, balance. There's no equality. You know, they're looking for equality of gender, of pay, of everything else. But now we're going to be, some Canadians are going to be more exposed to the risk of faulty and unnecessary and punitive incarceration and charges against your rights. And some of us aren't going to be as equally exposed. Uh, so that's that's not working. Um, as well, the police now, it's... Um, we have the Vancouver Sun here telling us that the police will be able to toke, but they must be fit for duty. Um, well, they don't have that uh, banner up at the donut shop. Not every cop is in uh, tip-top shape. You ever notice that? You ever you ever take a look at a cop and, and, you know, he's in a car or walking down the street and you check out his physique and go, I could get away from that guy, no problem. Um, so now they're worried about them being in shape or fit for duty. While members of the Canadian Armed Forces must refrain from using cannabis in the eight hours before they report for duty and for 24 hours before handling a firearm, regulations for police officers don't appear to be as tight. I think it's pretty obvious if you study any of the news that regulations for police officers don't appear tight. I mean, who else can take a shot and maybe take a guy's life and go on unpaid leave or paid leave while they wait for something to come by and look the other way? Uh, it's pretty sick, but uh, and I mean that in the true original uh, definition. So here we go. The uh, police officers and the military are being judged separately in the importance of their duties, both of which involve firearms. But the military says we're going to wait 24 hours uh, and the uh, police say they need to wait four or so many hours, which is crazy. Um, I don't like the military aspect of it, especially because just everyone acquiescing to that is the decision the military will make is understandable. They're a 
an organization under themselves. But they're looked up to by so many people in society, as are the police and doctors and all of these uh, pillars of our Western world, as being on top of things and knowing what they're doing. And if you're going to set a 24-hour gap between cannabis use and you know using something in- intricate and important and you- something you need to be careful with, like a firearm, it's irresponsible to, to subconsciously suggest and to manipulate minds into thinking like, okay, so people aren't going to be in the military, are going to be thinking, you know, if you really want to be clear-headed, you got to wait 24 hours because that's what the military does. No, that's fiction. So everyone's setting an arbitrary level and an arbitrary limit. Know yours. Know what your limit is and know your arbitrary. That's what you need to do. Just like I took power from the medical community to turn myself around, you have to do the same thing. Uh, and make sure you understand you're not being given the short shrift. So while that was going on with the police, we also have a situation in Vancouver where the Vancouver police um, perform what's called a totally counterproductive raid on a marijuana market, says that one of Vancouver's leading harm reduction advocates says she's outraged after a police uh, raid on her marijuana distribution program last Friday. And um, yeah, it's 28 days. I'm being corrected on something. I was going to go back to that. I, I, I got that. Hang on a second, Danny. So one of Vancouver's leading harm reduction advocates says she's outraged. It's a long fucking time anyway, Danny. Okay, so I said 24 hours are supposed to wait. It's 28 days before the military. Either way, it's a ridiculous standard. Uh, the point's the same. They're subconsciously feeding bogus information, bogus needs into the collective consciousness. It's not true. You have to wait a fucking month to be able to do something important after smoking a joint. And anybody believing that has to either just solely respect that's what the military wants, but the military doesn't know what it's talking about when it issues such a, an arbitrary command. So don't... Don't look up to that particular uh, uh, piece of information as valid for yourself, unless you're in the military and you have to follow along because you're an employee. But don't think that the military has, um, has the final say on how long you have to wait before doing something incredibly intricate and important. They're just wrong. They're being over-concerned. Don't think that's what you need to do. Don't think that you need to wait days and days and days and days and hours and hours and hours and hours to be functioning properly. In fact, quite the opposite. People who aren't well need that med to keep going. Uh, cops don't seem to care about that. Uh, the OPS's High Hopes program offers marijuana to drug users in an effort to mitigate their use of stronger, more lethal substances. And that's what they were doing in Vancouver. High Hopes sells its products in an open-air market on Hastings and in the downtown east side. And they were busted and everything was taken away. And the cops know damn well it's for opioid users. But we don't really care about opioid users. This is painfully clear from both the creators and the regulators. And I'll say that if any any percentage, a tiny percentage of what goes on with opioids and sickness and death and, and dependency happened to cannabis, uh, they would have shut it, shut it all down with tanks years ago. They seized cannabis intended for opioid substitution. And they know exactly what it is. That's what it says in the straight.com that tears were shed at the market when cops arrived to take away the weed because this cannabis supplied on a nonprofit basis to low-income people in pain. And you know what Canada says to non-profit bases, people who are distributing cannabis for compassionate purposes to people in pain? They're saying, fuck you. I'm getting rich like you can't believe. And if you open a market or distribute it anywhere else, that means I'm losing a couple of bucks and I don't give a shit about your pain. And that's coming from Justin Trudeau, the cop that monkeyed this series of shenanigan rules into place, and everybody on down. And we'll talk about politicians later. On this show, what I said about the uh, military, Danny, 28 hours or 24 hours or 28 days or whatever it is, I'm sorry, I had it and it fell out. I read it there. It looked like 24 hours. It seemed more reasonable than 28 days, so I was giving them the credit. (laughs) But if it's 28 days, my goodness, that's terrible. Pot legalization will mean more work for police in B.C., says an RCMP official. This is another fake trope. This is just like the military telling you you need way too much time for something to uh, to not be important. Because um, 
we don't need more work for police in BC, RCMP official. They're laying it on like it's a guilt trip. Like if you weren't doing this, we wouldn't have to beef up everything. This is a complete opposite flip the telescope around way to look at it. Because the truth of the matter is this, and I don't know where all the previous episodes are where I've already said this, but it bears repeating just like a McDonald's commercial, uh, which you do know and remember and have heard. So you'll excuse me if I once again remind the listening audience that we do have around the world in Northern Ireland, uh, Ireland, England, Australia, South Africa, all over the States, and a lot of places in Canada too. And in England, let me just remind you all, the entire world, but of course I'm broadcasting from Toronto, but here is the solid, easy to remember truth. If you really decriminalized and you really removed penalty of risk of use of cannabis based on nothing more than the science available and the rights required. There would be hours and hours and countless hours on the accounting spreadsheets of all the police hours that were not required because you're not arresting people for something that's genuinely free no, there's no police records now of chasing people around who have peanut butter to find out if they're using it in a, and then if they are going to court and prosecuting it and saying they had so much peanut butter and they weren't allowed to have peanut butter and arresting the peanut butter and seizing it and showing it to people and telling them not to eat peanut butter if they didn't have to do that anymore because peanut butter was legal how many dollars do you think they would need in their budget? How many fewer dollars? 20%? 30%? Even 10% fewer would be horrible for policemen who will have... We will need fewer of them. When you get to the truth and you understand exactly this entire scenario, the world looks to Canada to see what it's going to do, Canada looks to the States and Portugal to see what works and they go with the opposite. But the point is true decriminalization, true observance of rights equals far fewer police. They're not needed to be able to police a substance that is peanut butter. There's nothing on the books, I'm sure, about police expenditure and needing more police and every time someone runs for mayor they say and there's too much crime in this city and if i'm elected i'll bring in more police and the mindless sheep cheer we're at a juncture now we should have been at 20 years ago and 20 years ago we should have been at it 30 years ago and this whole um wiping out of culture and health over the last eight or nine decades in North America should never have needed to happen. So now that it's legal, we don't need more cops. We don't need people telling us that because we test positive for having it in our body that we are impaired. It's just not okay. Especially once again in Canada, you have a list of punishments. A list of the punishments for driving high on marijuana in every Canadian province. We're going to talk about that more with Brian when he comes in shortly. We're going to talk about opioids when he comes in uh, a little bit more, um, a few more, more minutes down the road. Because I've got a big axe to grind. You think about how many people died from opiates and opioids over the past several, 20 years, 21 years the same juncture in time they knew that cannabis was already working and that anecdotal was history and they needed to start experiments for medical use they sat on it and instead here comes oxycontin right at the same juncture in time right around 2000 2001 oxycontin provided to us by a family as pointed out by Stephen Colbert on a mainstream CBS the family that brought in oxy is now bringing in the medicine you can use to get off of oxy and uh, they, they don't experience any punishment whatsoever. And it's super uncomfortable uh, to think about it because on the one hand, um, on the one hand, you have um, 
an addiction issue that's out of control with a legal substance, and on the other hand, you have a non-addiction issue that isn't out of control with an allegedly dangerous and illegal cannabis. So I'm really getting tired of it because it doesn't make any sense. But more than that, it's the doctors. The doctors are saying now uh, in Canada that they really don't want medical cannabis as a thing at all. They'd rather not have it. It says Canadian doctors are worried about medical marijuana because of a lack of clinical research. Now, that's what they told me five years ago when I used it and saved my life anyway, and now here I sit. And here they are at Newsweek in the United States providing an article on the Canadian uh, recreational marijuana use. And they're calling it marijuana because that's old school. They're still trying to enforce the old stereotypes. They're still making it seem like it's a big dangerous thing. And when they do a little infographic on it, what kind of music do they use? Reggae man. So this is Newsweek magazine talking about cannabis. Says though use has been legal for Canadians since 01. The Cannabis Act will allow the sale and consumption of recreational marijuana starting in October. Actually, Newsweek said September, but they were wrong. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau promised to legalize weed during his 2015 campaign. And he tweeted his support for the Cannabis Act after it passed the Senate. And he said, it's been too easy for our kids to get marijuana. He's still saying it, this putz. And for criminals to reap the profits. Well, it sounds like he is... um, interested in doing that it's because that's exactly what they're doing it is too easy for your kids to get marijuana not as easy as it is to get sugar so that's another pack of lies and the canadian uh uh, medical folks that don't want to have this because of a lack of clinical research if you don't do the research you don't have the clinical research what's the matter with you people unbelievable to me And uh, we're going to get into a few other topics as well, and we're going to do it uh, with our guest once he comes into the studio, which will be pretty soon, I can imagine. He's right outside. I do want to mention that um, as much as they want to put everybody away, uh, courts have ruled that medical cannabis users cannot be charged with driving under the influence. What? That sounds like a complete contradiction of everything you were just saying. Yes, the Arizona Court of Appeals has ruled that the state's medical cannabis patients who have been charged with DUI may contest the charges against them. And that's exactly what's going to happen in Canada. And they're going to be so filled with court cases. I would like to make a prediction uh, a little more solid. I've kind of danced around it over the past uh, few weeks. But I think that between our legalization in mid mid late October... And the spring break, uh, when the kids want to go down to Florida and have fun in the sun, um, they're probably going to be uh, in a courtroom somewhere defending the fact that they tested positive for having cannabis in their system and are now fighting that system, uh, trying to prove that they weren't high, they weren't impaired, they just had cannabis in their system. Uh, But Canada seems to be running with this faulty and false presence. And speaking of presence, we now have uh, Brian O'Day in the room. Let me just shake your hand, sir. Thank you so much for coming in. This gentleman is the pot father, okay? That's his nickname, and the reason is uh, Brian, as I said at the beginning of the show, um, a long time ago got himself involved in uh, cannabis, or did you call it marijuana back then, uh, smuggling, and, and they, his big problem was that um, it's real difficult to get away with 75 tons of that stuff under your charge, and, and uh, Brian, unfortunately for himself and uh, his friends and family, did some time and he's here to tell us about everything that led up to that and and his life afterwards which is completely different so please welcome brian o'day to the show hey thank you such a thrill i saw brian at the uh, karma cup a couple of weeks ago and asked him to come on and here he is so um good sir you've lived a heck of a life and you look like you got a lot more time on you uh, yeah well so i certainly hope so yeah i think it's fantastic that uh, that you're here uh, this is another canadian of course and um uh, Brian, can we can we just start out a little bit uh, early on in the in your career, and let's go. <laughs> yeah, I guess you call it a career. It um, was. How, however, you started or got the idea. I mean, was it in the seventies? Were you smoking a joint, thinking, "Gee whiz, I'd like more of this"? How did it all get going? You couldn't have imagined one day you'd go down with seventy five tons. No, it was actually in the sixties, and uh, it started just simply smoking a joint, and and. Uh, I got high, I liked it, and um, I had to figure out how to get more. 
and how I was able to afford it eventually. You know, I, I blew through my tuition and, and rent money and food money, and and then I uh, got some fronted to me and cut it up into nickels and dimes and sold it. And, and what did that mean back then? Nickel was like five dollars worth of pot. Nickel was like a little matchbox, a little wooden matchbox okay. filled with pot. And, and it, it was, was five dollars yeah. worth of pot. Yeah. And, and the dimes were ten bucks dimes for twice was, that. Yes. Etc. Right. And yeah. uh, then from there, I uh, quickly realized that you know I'm from Newfoundland, and I used to go up to the mainland to buy the products that I would bring back to Newfoundland. And Newfoundlanders in those days weren't treated with the respect that uh, they seem to command today. And uh, we were the brunt of jokes, and we were abused by mainlanders frequently mm -hmm. and so we were you know we paid more for the product coming to toronto or montreal to get it than people who lived here um i met a guy from england and he said i'll introduce you to some friends of mine in england and he did and that's when it went from a canadian trip to an international trip and okay. i started smuggling hash from england oh you started smuggling from england that yeah. was your first smuggle yeah that was my my first border okay. smuggle now, this is a long time ago, of course, and everything in the world will be different. And so uh, uh, I'm going to ask, how did you smuggle it? I mean, you could have just walked right on the plane and sat down back in those days. And different security, yeah. No security. No, you just give them your suitcase and go get your seat, right? That's all Yeah, you and, you know, I had the hash strapped to my body, so wow. that was it. How much hash would you carry on your body? Like Ten what? pounds. Ten pounds? That's the first one. And their little equal distributed yeah. packets around your torso, etc. Yeah. So when you saw the movie A Midnight Express, and and Billy is I never saw that. You movie. never saw that movie? No. Oh wow, there's a scene in there intentionally. where intentionally. Okay, yeah. He's he's taped up with hash as you describe, and they get on the plane, and the whole time he's just dun 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 dun. You hear his heart beating like crazy, and the sweat's coming down, and he's on the plane, and they're starting to go, and he's like, oh good. But then the plane stops and the guys come on and they take them off and the movie starts. <laughs> right. It's quite the... Uh, it's, I had it's, similar things like that happen to me in Colombia when I was, uh, you know, I first got out of prison in 72. I, I went to prison in 72 for pot and then when I get out I was trying to get a steak. So I, I smuggled a little bit of coke and um, the evil substance for sure that thing took my life and cocaine yeah it was an awful substance anyway for a while i was involved with it and and uh twice leaving columbia i got pulled in by their cops but managed to at the airport at the airport yeah wow what did they go through your stuff and find it strip me naked everything the first time i held the coke in my hand and the second time, uh, it was in a false bottom of a suitcase, which when they were searching, I held the bottom that had the Coke in it so they wouldn't notice how heavy it was and just threw the clothes out and said, see, and they shook the suitcase out. And they didn't it's, find it? No, they didn't find Unbelievable. it. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I was lucky. And, and you and lost 12 pounds of sweat once you took your seat on the plane? Yeah. 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 That's incredible. So cocaine. So let's take a little jaunt down there for a second. Yeah. Um, uh, I've done it. Um, mm -hmm. Anybody my age probably has uh, considered doing it, if not done it. I, I did it in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Everybody was doing it, man. <laughs> that was and, when it was fun, it seemed. Yeah. And, uh, you what know, happened? What, God, it was like it changed universally. The vibration of it changed. It went from being fun to being an isolator. It went from we'd go out every night and play and, you know, stay up all night and sleep the next day and go back and do it again and just have fun. And at a certain point in the 70s, something happened to that substance, and it became a real problem for everybody that I knew was doing it. And this is all pre-crack, by the way. This is all pre-crack days, right? I mean, it was it already It is. Nuts. Well, crack was kind of happening then. Uh, you know, there was a thing called base then, uh, bazura, which uh, is, you know, when you're involved in the coke business, when you get your... Uh, original form of cocaine from the people who are processing it, you get a thing called base, and then you turn it into uh, into cocaine. The base is the same as as crack, basically. Okay, you're right. But it's pre uh, it being made into coke. Most of the crack is coke that's turned back into base. Um, so it was around then. I never liked it then, and thank God I never liked it ever. Um, friends of mine around me did, and and that's ended nice. up in trouble yeah. with it. Uh, I didn't like it. Um, and then, you know, when I stopped liking Coke, it took me about five years to stop doing it. 
Wow. Yeah, it's kind of bizarre. You so know? were you hating yourself with every line you snorted kind of thing? or, or? Sort of. Um, it, You know, it, Coke was only... The only time I enjoyed Coke in kind of the last four or five years I did it was uh, the anticipation of doing it. Oh, right. The moment I did the action and actually did it, it was all downhill from there until, you know, three Right or four up to the first later. line, line it there, it's good. And then, something good, and then yeah. it just turned into a nightmare. And, yeah. You know, it never got better. Well, I'm so lucky because I, I did the same thing. I tried it a few times. I, I, I went to some parties. There was a place nearby downtown. I took it maybe... I don't know, eight or ten times snorting it. And then uh, it, it got to the point where uh, someone introduced crack. It was it was on the news. The police were lamenting its arrival. And, and I did try some. And we somehow or other, I don't know how this happened, but we smoked it off the, the top of a, a, a pop tin or a beer can or something. Right. And someone had done that. And I did that. I found it horrendous metallic and terrible and then it made me feel like shit and and then people started getting hooked on a left right center i couldn't believe it it's hard to believe huh i don't know how you would want to do that over and over again yeah um i saw a lot of people do that and just kept chasing that dragon hollywood henderson who was a uh and this is how crazy it makes you i'll give you one quick story sure hollywood henderson was a professional football player and he kept getting he was a top he was a star and but he was a problem wherever he went, and he got traded quickly. And, and uh, you know, people would be glad to take him for a minute until they realized what he was up to. And he was basically, he was the crack king in NFL. Mm. And every team that he got traded to, he had everybody in the hotel room smoking crack with him. <laughs> and he tells this story of they were all in the room, and everybody was, you know, chasing the pipe, and it's my turn, no, it's my turn. They're all fighting each other for the correct pipe, and the curtains are drawn, and it's dark in there, and there are eight or ten of them in there, and all of a sudden, one of them hits the floor and slithers across the floor and creeps up and pokes out the window, and he looks out the window for about 20 minutes, and he hits the floor and comes back, and he says, there are 20 cops in the parking lot. Henderson said, I hit that floor, and crossed and looked out the window. I was there for about 10 minutes and came back and said, I can only see 18. <laughs> so, you know, that was the nature of that thing. It just yeah. turned into uh, a horrible substance that destroyed everybody that touched it, basically. Yeah. Uh, is it still, um, I mean, everybody that seems to be doing anything is, of that nature is crack, crackhead. Are, are they still, is it, do people still casually partake of powder? I don't even know. Like cocaine you know is a thing? I don't even know It's that. been 30 years since I've done it. Okay. And uh, in the 20 years leading up to it, I saw that stuff every day. Yeah. In the 30 years since, I've only seen it twice. Right. I never so hear about it. I, I never don't. hear about it either, but you know, I, I, I'm I told people still do it. I yeah. I don't see it, and I I've don't never hang seen with it. people who do it. Yeah, I really don't. It doesn't... Uh, it used to be going on. That's what I mean. All, regular folks, uh, people I would hang around with doing party. it. every party. Yeah. Yeah. And you'd go to the bathroom and you'd say, you want to go to the bathroom? Yeah. If someone asks you if you want to go to the bathroom, that means... Yeah, that's, that's what was going yeah. on. It got to where we never even went to the bathroom. Yeah, no, We just do it at the table at the clubs and it, wow. it was crazy. And uh, so Thank it is God a terrible drug. Over. We're we're not all about that on this show at all. I don't I don't promote it. Uh, although I don't want to arrest someone that's done it. Um, no, but that's, that's that's another issue. That's you know one, the drug war is a war on the weakest among us. It's a horrible cowardly cowardly war. Yeah. Anyway. Well, um, as you know, uh, through your your career, we've had different phases of awareness and and practice in Canada uh, with cannabis, and now we are heading into. Uh, a, a series of rules uh, that have been dreamed up over a certain amount of time. I'm sure you're well versed on, on what might be coming. I'd love to get your take on, uh, you know, where it was or where it is at this second, and where it will be on October 17th. Huh. Well, it, you know, I, I look at the government and I, I look at the bureaucratic response to this product, uh, this amazing product. And we're back to talking about uh, cannabis again, by the way. Cannabis and. Um, they're acting like this is something that just happened and they're trying to wrap their heads around how to deal with it well listen <laughs> yeah. let me tell you all you goofballs in those suits we've been doing this for 50 friggin years 60 years and we've been doing okay and all of your bullshit and your lie making and your arguing for uh, preventing this from being legalized up until now everything that you talk about in that regard was based on a lie so your entire argument about pot is lie-based. And now you're doing this 
driving while influenced under the influence of marijuana. Listen, if that was a problem, we'd know about that 50 years ago. 40 years ago. You don't think they would have pounced ago. on that like red meat? We would have known oh, yeah. about that. Look, we've known about it with alcohol. We changed the laws around alcohol. If marijuana was doing the same thing, we'd know about it. It's not. It's a lie. I don't know why they're doing yeah. it. It's like um, seatbelts. I mean, when seatbelts came in, it was because so many people have been thrown through the car windshield, etc. And, and so time tested, they realized we do need seatbelts and we're going to put them in. Right. And, and now they, right. they don't have this kind of data on cannabis. Or, they don't. Or they say it's they do. It's a lie. Yeah. No, it's a total lie. And yeah. no matter, no one can show any proof. Uh, look, here's the, tr- here's the truth of the matter. Highway deaths have dropped by 11% since they legalized marijuana in Nevada. Okay, that's an interesting statistic. It's not going the way that mad or people of that ilk want. Mm-hmm. But that's the truth. The truth. So um, the and and let's talk about something else. Opioids, um, in in where they've legalized marijuana in the first year, they've seen a fifteen percent reduction. By the fifth year, they've seen a thirty five percent reduction in the number of opioid addictions. Right. So uh, it's it's so interesting how this product has been so vilified, and I can't imagine why. I try and wrap my head around. <laughs> you don't some have any theories. <laughs> argument about it uh you know it's been noted forever that it makes people feel better oh yeah so obviously that's a problem for our government and i don't understand why those people are they make me think of them and us you know they're dividers sure not unifiers well it's it's interesting that you say that because i completely agree with all of this uh it feels great to have somebody who's far more experienced and understands these things uh sing these same songs but what i'm really having a trouble with is the perception issue like just before you came in i said that i made a mistake i said 20 24 hours and i should have said 24 days it's possibly 28 days that the military demands uh once you've as a recreational user in the military now these new rules you have to wait 28 days before you do something important like fire a gun or maybe drive a tank or something. What a bunch of... And and then the cops are saying stuff. they have 24 hours before having access to and so many hours. And, and the thing that concerns me is I get that those institutions want to set their rules, but I hate to think that someone who would think, well, the military knows what they mean and I can't, I shouldn't do something important it's for 24 arbitrary. weeks. It's so arbitrary, but people believe it like it's Santa Claus coming. Well, because people want to believe what they... Th- what position people in positions of authority say people want to believe that they want to trust our system people want to trust the system we live in i want to trust the system we live in i don't trust it at all but i want to Uh, and some people's desire to trust the system makes them believe fantasy and this is where we find ourselves with pot look let me just say my biggest problem with what's happened with marijuana in this country is this the road to this legalization, to making billionaires out of dozens of people, millionaires out of thousands of people is what's happening right now in the cannabis world. That road's paved with broken families, incarcerated people, families whose lives have been destroyed, who have been shamed, who have been imprisoned, um, who've had everything taken from them and then given criminal records and been unable to enter society again. That's who, that's what, that's the constituents of the pavement through which these now millionaires and billionaires have driven over to get here. Yeah. All of the people who created this industry, who made this industry, who stood on the front lines and accepted incarceration for this industry, they got the finger as the feds gave it to the people. It, 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 it's, I, you know, sorry, I didn't finish that, but I, yeah. I'll finish it differently. Um, forgive me, indigenous people, but I feel like you must have felt years ago when the white man showed up and took your industry and gave it to the thieves who took it from you. Well, that's the way the marijuana industry is. The suits showed up. They saw the money. They took the industry from the people who created it. They uh, gave them all criminal records, and then they gave the industry to their billionaire friends. That's what happened. And then they tell you, oh, you were caught once being a bad guy. You can't participate in this And now you can't work in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, they're leaning on. They don't want people with experience and knowledge to be bud tenders, and where they don't want people who know what's going on working. I I want to tell them one thing: bite me. (laughs) 
Yeah. Okay. This is the mindset. This is the mindset of the same people that we do have here in uh, Health Canada. Okay, so Health <laughs> Health Canada is saying um, that uh, they have asked 102 drug manufacturers. So that's a lot of companies, right? Uh, uh, yeah. To stop. They have. A I mean, I'm reading the news. This is off CBC. They've asked 102 drug manufacturers and distributors to stop marketing opioids. Can you please stop doing this? Can you imagine with your please weed? Please stop doing Is it okay it. if you could just stop? And then 25 of these folks have responded. So less than 25% have even responded. And the story goes on. It says, this summer, Health Canada asked that many to do it, and they all have only gotten back with that, that tiny less than 25%. 4,000 Canadians died from apparent apparent opioid overdoses. That means there are more that aren't apparent, and that's up from 3,000 in 2016. As part of the government's response to the crisis, Health Minister Jeanette Petitpas-Taylor and the Director General of Health Canada wrote to 102 opioids. They wrote to them. Isn't that nice? They didn't send squad cars and distributors and affiliates earlier to ask them, stop pitching the drugs, and they are not getting back to them, and they are not responding. Then we have this quick story about the opioid billionaire is granted a patent for addiction treatment. The guy that... Sackler. Sackler, who uh, brought this stuff on us all. Not only is he not punished, he will also benefit from its alleged relief, which I'm sure will also not work so well. Plus, the Sackler family, and here's just another little bit of information about those evil people, uh, the billionaires from the sale of oxycodone. Uh, the Sackler family uh, is now pushing generic oxycodone in third world countries and um, just pushing it through like crazy. They've lost their market in the U.S., but now they're in the rest of the world. And uh, here they are up to the same thing. Um, and, and, and now they're going to make money on the other side of it, too. Look, people like this, honestly, I don't believe in heaven or hell almost all the time. But when I hear stories like this, I want to believe there mm -hmm. is a hell for people like that. Oh, absolutely. I just, uh, I'm, I'm horrified. When I think of all of the beautiful people I met in prison who are struggling human beings, just trying to make a living for their families, uh, and, and, and poverty-stricken with no way out, and then I think of these people whose actions are responsible for an awful lot of these people being in prison. It's incalculable, it's just, it's really. It's totally incalculable. The cost of their billions in profits is in the trillions. It simply is. Look, when there's a tiny little town in West Virginia of 200 people that received, what, 20, 30 million oxycodone tablets from that company, yeah. and no one flagged it, we know what they were up to. They were pushing frigging heroin. Call it anything else yeah. you want. But this Sackler family and their friends were pushing heroin. That's what they were doing. And they were addicting a huge swath of the country. And now the United States is paying the price. But it's, only, it's interesting. Only when the white American male gets hooked on heroin is the country willing to do anything about the opioid crisis. Right, right. right? Yeah. And when the middle class white male finds it in his system then they're willing to do something about it but when people in poverty black white or otherwise have these problems they're vilified and incarcerated now they're thinking about you know doing something else it's uh you know we've approached this we we put uh, disease in the hands of law enforcement and uh, we see how well that's worked it's well this is worked. the thing i mean Purdue Pharmacy for making this. I, I, I put them as the granddaddy of all this. There are, of course, other companies. But the good news is, Brian, I don't know if you heard me. We sent them a letter to ask them to stop. I don't know what you're all upset right. about. I know. It's uh, And, oh, my gosh, that's such an important letter. We yeah. sent them a letter. It's funny. I had uh, a couple ounces of pot and had 14 cops show up at my house. Wow. They, so they didn't send you a letter saying they please. did not send me and they didn't uh, give me any warning whatsoever okay well this is the thing that I'm, I'm i'm making light of it and it's not to be made light of but i can't deal with this shit unless i put some sarcasm and jokes in there because it's just you know it's a buffer to the soul i really can't take this in full on that not only are these people doing this and and they're horrible for doing it and now profiting on some alleged uh, it will be equally pushed as a re relief at, to get off of this other drug not only are they doing it they're obviously being 
uh, accepted and allowed and molly coddled and and their lobbying efforts do fall on willing ears not deaf ears and and so they go around with this fake named company called purdue pharma uh where these guys keep cranking out both the problem and uh, the alleged cause of the problem i won't be surprised to find out this alleged co- f- cure for the problem is also needing another drug to fix it Right. Unintended. Well, drug companies are famous for giving you drugs that you have to chase with other drugs to deal with the repercussions of the drug. Yeah. It's uh, bizarre one after the other. Um, and, you know, for the most part, up until up until now, that Coca-Cola and uh, uh, Molson's and Budweiser and uh, Constellation Brands and and all of these people got interested, it was an evil thing. But now that, you know, we got, what are they going to do? Are they going to stop Coca-Cola people from going back and forth across the border? And the Bank of Montreal has got, I don't know, I guess the bank has over half a billion, maybe maybe a billion in the pot business. Bank of Montreal, uh, bank in, of Montreal. In, deeply invested into the cannabis industry. Yes, so if you are a shareholder in the Bank of Montreal, I wouldn't be telling them that at the border because they'll stop you from crossing the border. I personally am not a shareholder in the Bank of Montreal, however. Right. But it's, uh, you know, it's so interesting. I, I think we're probably uh, months away from legalization federally in the United States, at least medicinally, um, because there's just far too much money at play here. And, you know, I, I was invited to speak a few years ago in Vancouver to five or six hundred stockbrokers. And when I was there, I realized, aha, this is it. It's changed. Money wants this thing now. Mm-hmm. So money's going to get it. Money gets yeah. everything it wants. And uh, look at the government. I mean, it's the best government money can buy. Here, the U.S., it's the same. It's it's a government bought by big money. Yeah. And uh, in the United States, that big money wants marijuana because there's trillions of dollars to be made there. And they're not going to let it stay illegal for much longer. Look, as of October 17th, the entire northern border of the United States is going to be selling legal marijuana. So all of these people in all of these states who like to smoke pot that cross the border to get this legal marijuana, when the United States realizes how much money is crossing the border in tourism for marijuana, quickly it will legalize. Wow. That is a way to look at it. Um, so that that's uh, I hope it goes that way. But listen, here here's the thing: these little tropes, these belief systems that they keep laying out. I can't believe that people still fall for this. For example, Justin Trudeau's tweet uh, recently that says, um, "It's been too easy for our kids." to get marijuana. He's still calling it marijuana. He's a weasel. And for he's criminals a, to reap the a, profits. He is a weasel. But this sounds like a door in, though. This this could be taken as a criticism. It's too easy for our kids to get it and for criminals to reap the profits. But what it sounds like an admission. <laughs> it sounds like it's easy for him to do it. But what about the sugar? What about Coca-Cola taking CBDs and cannabinoids and putting them in their drink, and you don't think that is going to be something that people... Are, are twigging on with sugar and everything else like it's such an obvious lie to say you are, you you care about the kids when you're putting sugar in salty snacks i mean sugar's everywhere sugar is a terrible thing and it's you know so much worse than marijuana um justin trudeau um it, he did one thing he legalized pot uh, he's done it completely uh, maliciously and and with a mean spirit he said a year and a half ago i heard him say this is not about people having fun yeah. It isn't. Wow. I don't know any other reason why people smoke marijuana, Mr. Trudeau. Um, your father smoked it, so uh, and your mother smoked it. And and you know what? They they weren't criminals when they smoked it. But you act as though until you put a wrap around it, we're criminals. And that's just simply wrong. Um, I expected more from him yeah. uh, and got so much less. I, the guy is I, yeah, a, unreal. a flat tire as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. No, I, I I don't care for the conservatives either, but no, of course. But at least the conservatives will be able to, with clear conscience, or relatively be able to cross the border. And say, I didn't have anything to do with that act. In fact, I voted against it. Right, <laughs> right. But you know, the conservatives are are totally with the money end of sure. this thing too. Yeah. Well, I just find it odd that he passes what's called the Cannabis Act and then goes on Twitter and says once again the children and marijuana. The children, and you know. When people pull out that children canard, I just want to throw up. What the heck? You know, that is an excuse for not parenting our own children. 
I'm the parent. I'm the parent of my four kids. I am the parent. The government is not their parent. The government will never be their parent. I am their parent, and I do not want the government to be the parent of any child in this country. The yeah. government is a lousy parent. They are, and there's a there's a, a very large um, fight going on here in Ontario. This is a complete sidebar. I didn't think to talk about, but they, they're uh, very uh, very upset. People are upset that they're changing their uh, their sex um, sexual education programs in mm-hmm. in Ontario mm-hmm. schools because Doug Ford is a boor. And what we is with that guy? We don't want him to take away everything from before. So. What is with that guy? That he doesn't want people to have the information that they should have <laughs> I don't know. to make decisions that they need to have. It's a trend. To need to make. You know, it's, uh, like Harper shutting down guy. the scientists. It's the same thing. We don't yeah. want science. We don't mention that. Like in North Carolina, six years ago, they put up rules saying, we don't want to do any litigation or, or any uh, uh, legislation that's contingent upon anything to do with weather control. And then they got hammered by this storm and everything right. came in. Uh, yeah, it's willful ignorance. I can only imagine that people uh, scamming and doing the scamming think they're going to be able to make their millions and enjoy it in a, in a world that's not affected by all this stuff. It's people who don't really care that their children are going to have to pay the price for all of our fucked up efforts, basically. Yeah, I guess so. I and guess so. They don't think about that. Well, this is an article that uh, we are fascinated by um, on this topic. Trudeau himself, and as you say, could be barred. Now, this is just on iPolitics.ca, uh, but it says this is um, a, a note that the Trudeau could be barred from the U.S. Uh, as he has smoke pot, uh, says a U.S. lawyer. A U.S. immigration lawyer um, is is saying that Justin admitted to smoking as an MP, um, and the second that the prime minister is no longer prime minister, ah, see, so traveling on diplomatic passport. But is his family, are his children, is everybody else? Like, if you're okay to go to the States, what about your, your kids as a diplomat? Well, my kids are all Americans, so fortunately. I'm no, you don't have a diplomat, it. though. I mean, I mean yeah. the collective you. I meant if you're a diplomat, yeah. you still can't bring your wife and your kids if, if, if you're, you know, Bank of Montreal shareholders who also drink Coca-Cola and, and, uh, and other normal things. You know, they're really drawing some crazy lines here. Yeah, that's that's gonna that that can't go on. That nope. simply can't go on. If you've got uh, you know fully, they expect by the time this is legalized, a year from legalization, that over half the population will have smoked marijuana, or or consumed it in one way or another. Sure. Um, I simply cannot imagine that the United States is going to keep half of the Canadians out of the country. Although you know, who knows? Yeah, it is hard to tell. Uh, this other little sort of related clip about Trudeau <clears throat> has left $372 million originally intended to help the veterans uh, unspent since taking off as bad on its own, but also because he criticized the previous conservative government for doing the exact same thing with a very similar number. Uh, so he's told the uh, he's told them that he doesn't have money for them. We don't have money. And now there's this massive amount of money. And while yeah. they're changing their access and, and causing problems for them to realize uh, so access to cannabis. So we have money to send these men and women mm-hmm. over to foreign countries to take bullets, to deliver bullets, to take lives, to have their lives put in jeopardy. Uh, and we put them in all kinds of danger and bring them back and expect them to be okay and if they're not well you got to figure that out because we don't have the money for you why does anybody join the military when they hear stories like that is what i don't know i really don't know it's very uh, i would never join the military in a million years for that very reason alone i mean i'm not a i'm not a gun shooter so i wouldn't join just because of that but if i even if i was a gun shooter these people do not have your back. Right. You're out there having this, this country's political back by taking shots in Afghanistan or wherever else you may be for a bunch of people who do not have your back. And when you come home, you're on your own. Yeah. And I'm sorry, we don't have the money for you. Why would you join an outfit that treated you that way? I don't know. I think a lot of people think, well, someone's got to go uh, guarantee the freedoms that we have here. And so they think, I, I don't know. A lot of people are um, interested in going. I, I know lots of people and I'm friends with people. I, but it's never been interesting to me to go and do that. Uh, for that I, absolute reason. And this arbitrary control, control that they put down. Um, before we get into advertising and, and the uh, perception. Um, advertising. Can we hang on one second? Sure. 
So uh, no advertising for pot in Canada. Right. But you turn on the business channel. Yeah. And there is one ad after the other for pot companies, but not for the pot, for their stock. Oh, well, what do they expect to bump up the stock with if they don't sell weed? They tell, we produce the best weed in Canada. We're this, we're that, this weed, that weed. This is canopy growth. This is Afria. This is Aurora. They advertise on the business network, these pot companies, that there is supposedly no advertising of marijuana products in yeah, Canada. Right. Their word is, we're not advertising marijuana. We're advertising the company's share value. Wow. Okay, That's... so they get a pass yeah. to do that, to promote their company, but if I want to put out the Potfather brand, I can't do can't that. Can't do it. If I want to put out the Brian O'Day brand, I can't do that. Yeah. The hypocrisy is immense. You know, there. what's really interesting is that there are bureaucrats who sit around thinking up this shit. Oh, that's what I think. Yeah, it's Just amazing. Sit around. Listen, Colorado. Yeah. I was trying to help some people in Colorado doing some consulting for them. And um, I had to get involved with packaging. So I, I talked to my friend, and he said, call this guy. He's a packaging guy, and he'll get you the compliance, packaging compliance. Mm -hmm. So I call him, and he said, well, the packaging compliance is about 260 pages. Are you sure you want to read it? You can talk to me for 1000 bucks a day, and I'll tell you what's in it. And believe me. For a day or two days with me, you'll get everything you need to get out of that compliance. So yeah. some bureaucrat <laughs> sat around, a bunch of bureaucrats, and wrote a 268-page compliance book on packaging for marijuana in Colorado. Unreal. Really? Yeah. So that's what happens when you let government get into business. Yeah. Well, this is this is what I've I've raised on the show many times is that uh, you know one of their more um, powerful complaints, such as what about the children and some other things, are that if you use cannabis and you you, you know this is part of your life, it's either a crutch. It's not a crutch if it's a medicine, then you, it's a medicine that you need. But if you need cannabis, then it's a crutch. But the thing is that they tell you that this stuff doesn't work. And then they tell you don't have enough research, and then they tell you can't advertise, and then they advertise at concerts. What about the children? Okay, let's talk about the children. Okay. Let's talk about the children who watch Hockey Night in Canada brought to you by Molson's. Let's talk about that, <laughs> alcohol, okay? Let's talk about the kids with all the Molson's T-shirts, with the Molson's on the T-shirts, yeah. the alcohol. Sure. Okay, let's talk about the most vile substance in this planet, and forgive me, I'm, I'm in a bar. You're leaving out uh, the bikini, babes. But the, the fact is... Alcohol causes more carnage on this planet than anything else. And tobacco is probably right there, right next to it. But the two substances that the government's been giving us for years cause more carnage than anything else. And we let, that's okay for kids? What about the kids? You know what? Go fuck yourself with what about the kids, you yeah. lying bastard. Oh, that is such a false argument. And anytime anyone says the children... I know they've run out of real argument because now they're telling me that the government's going to be my kids or my grandkids parent. No, you're not. You are not. And yeah. that's just it. So what about the children? Just these fake little hooks that they put on. You know, it's just a fake little hook. But this other fake little hook that they put on is, look, we're designing all of this. We know what we're doing. You terrible people want to use this stuff. So finally, we have to design some things. But we're concerned that you're going to damage your brain. Now, I look at the architecture, the rules, the hypocrisies. I go, your brain is already damaged. What are you talking about? I'm not emulating your way of thinking. This is ridiculous. I mean, this is the funny part to me. That they're worried about your brain. And who could? I don't even think I could come up with a series of laws so screwed up if I tried to sit down and come up with a series of laws so screwed up. It's amazing to me. Well, you know, they they put in in positions of authority in the file were incarcerators. Mm. Incarcerators. Yeah. People who were locking us up were put in charge of the file. Okay? Mm -hmm. That yeah. says everything I need to hear right there. Okay. Yeah. The guys who were locking us up are in charge of the file. Um, and, and you look at 
Ernie Ease, former premier of, of this, this yeah, province. Yeah, let's go there. He's the head of the uh, biggest paw company in Jamaica. Uh, the former deputy commissioner of the RCMP, the head of another paw company. I mean, I did a tour with the RCMP once, and I come from a position of legalizing all drugs. Right. Because... Uh, you know, illegalized and making drugs illegal and vilifying the weakest among us is a bad idea. And until we legalize all drugs, listen, there are only two ways people get drugs, legally or illegally. And you've seen what the way that we've handled it has worked. We've built prisons and we've filled them up with millions of people. So obviously that's not the right way. So let's turn it over to people who are actually health experts who can help people. I have not met an addict who wants to be one when they get there. Mm -hmm. So we need to help people, not vilify them, not isolate them, not separate them from us. We need to help them back in. And, uh, you know, we don't have governments that are interested in that. We have governments that are interested in punishing the weakest among us. Yeah, I think we. I think it's really not about changing the mind of the government. It's about making the 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 truth and the the uh, facts available and aware to anybody that can challenge the government. Because they only get away with this stuff because most people don't know about it. Most I had people, people don't telling me. It. I'm sure you had people coming up to you because I had this. They know you're got some kind of history with cannabis, like they do with me when if they know me. And they come up and they've been saying things like, "Wow, hey, October 17, you must be excited. Hey, you must be happy. It's finally going to be legal." And they have no idea the exact import of their words. The word "legal," what does it mean? Why would I be happy that something really fucked up is about to be born? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I look at this legislation of if the legislation were perfect and you compared it to architecture. Those are some pretty fine plans there, and the building's going to be wonderful and grand. But they've just delivered shit mm -hmm. from Home Depot. Here's some two-by-fours. Here's some nails. This is what it is. Make do. We'll fix it as we go. And then you see you go to a place like Newfoundland. The government is only letting the retailers make 8%. Profit? Yeah. That's all they're how allowed do they, to make How do they the figure pot. they're going to manage to control uh, You know that. what? How does a retailer make it making 8%? I don't know. I, most want retailers I know are 50-50. <laughs> they make half, they pay half. Uh, you know, I buy a product for 50 cents, I sell it for a dollar. Here you buy a product for a dollar, you sell it for a dollar eight. Yeah, that's ridiculous. It's, so the government wants all the money. You Isn't see, it funny, is too? All the money. They want all the money. They go on these... Um Tours, they'll do speaking town hall events in their province and across the country. Kathleen Wynne did one here. And one of their constant politician laments is that they're examining the landscape and they're open for suggestions to find out ways to drum up the economy. And Kathleen Wynne and Justin Trudeau have taken the economy. Imagine if we had shops popping up here and there. Hey, say your weed's not as good. Well, you're going out of business. My weed's better. I'm doing okay. Like that thing, you know, let's do that. Yeah, open market. And, you know, democracy. Mm -hmm. You know, the money you say you need that, that you don't have right now for all kinds of things. I don't know what the tax income right now is at in, in Colorado, but better than here on it. And they just don't exercise any of these options while they tell you this stuff. And that's fake, you know, about the kids and, and, and we can't advertise it. But we will advertise it to the people that are the multimillionaires we already made the deals with. Right. What do you know about Ernie Eves? I find it amazing that a guy who was a conservative uh, premier, he was the actual finance minister of this province and then became the premier later on after Harris. Another miserable character. Yeah, but a big star on the blue team. Right. Oh, and, yeah. and so Huge he goes star. down to Jamaica. Very miserable guy. Blame poverty on the poor. Opens up a, a cannabis uh, or, or, or is the head of some kind of. So fill me Largest in here. What do you know about that Largest cannabis company in Jamaica. I don't know much about it other than that's that. Uh, and, you know, just the fact that it is that. Uh, look at John Boehner, the former Speaker of the House in the United right. States, who said good people don't smoke marijuana. He was an alcoholic. He, he owns a bar. Yeah. Smoke cigarettes, chain smoker. So here's a guy who had all kinds of bad things to say about pot, is now the chairman of a Michigan pot company. Is that right? And his word was, I've had a change of heart. No, you had a change of wallet. Let's yeah. tell the truth about this. You have a change of heart. You got money, and that's how that's you change all it your is. position. Like you Julian Fantino, the cop, who's at this... Another uh, one. Paid... Uh, uh, paid chill for the government's pot legislation. I can't believe that there may be someone now only just now beginning to get the chance to rebuild their life that 
was taken from them by Julian's arrest back in the day, and they're just kind of getting out of jail and trying to figure things out maybe now while this guy rolls around like a pig in a trough with our dollars. I got friends who are still in prison for pot who got 75 years for pot that didn't exist. Conspiracy. What do you mean it didn't exist? Conspiracy charge. Oh, I see. No pot. Wow. And uh, huh. they're, you know, they're never getting out. Basically, they're going to die there. And there are a lot of people in the United States who are in prison right. for pot who are going to die there. God, that's and unreal. That's just the way it is. See, these people back when I got sentenced to ten years, I thought that was a huge sentence in '91. Uh, well, when I got there, I realized, gee, it was actually a tiny sentence. Did I was you do one of full ten? Lucky guys. No, I didn't. Uh, I got transferred to Canada, and they let me out. Um, but uh, the people in the U.S. are are just doing thrilling time for pot, and you know many of them will die in there yeah. because they were sentenced under the new law, and the new law means you serve eight and a half days of every ten days you were sentenced. Wow. So there's no more parole, or it is just... it is monstrous. It, it, I can't even believe it. I mean, when I started to realize based on my reading and understanding things and, and, and you know, studying the poli- the politicians that were involved, I thought, this thing is going to be so bad. And, and I'm sitting in front of it now. I, I was dead right about it. But I was paying attention. It's not like I'm a genius. I don't think most people pay attention to it. You know, whereas my life depended on it. So I was very much on point, you know. Yeah, and, you know, in the U.S., if you were ever charged, there was no winning. I had one right. of my uh, friends in there... Um, he got charged with a bunch of other guys, and they all pleaded out and got five years. He decided to challenge it, and because he challenged it, he got 35. Wow. And, you know, you got to realize in the U.S. when you're charged, 99-plus percentage of federal charges end up in convictions. Sure. And most of them are negotiated convictions, plea agreements. Yeah. Because they threaten you with a million things, so you're just glad to accept one and run away well let's go back to prison for a second because i want to talk about the mind um i really believe and i i think i would say i know but if i had to argue with someone i'd be back to the position of i believe but i believe that the cannabis uh the thc specifically that people get afraid about when they use rick simpson oil or something and they just want to use cbds that element itself i credit with some of my uh, ability to find awarenesses to further help me out of my cancer jam that I wouldn't have come across and wouldn't have meditated on and wouldn't have thought about. And here you say, when you were off to prison, that you weren't planning on writing anything but words to save your life slash mind. As you wrote down what you heard happening around you, you thought it might be an interesting process to write the stories of the major delineating course committing events in your life in a chronological matter so that you could sniff the tracks which led you to such an address vis-a-vis prison. Uh, it can be a useful exercise. You've determined to see and smell and know from whence I you come and if you don't like where you are you can realign your pieces going forward. So. This is amazing to me that you, it seems like you, you, okay, so you're in the box, can't get out, and uh, and you're getting to the awareness that, okay, I'm going to lay all this down here. This is helpful. This is a therapy, isn't it? It's like... Uh, um, that's not how it happened, so here's okay. how it happened. I was reading I your website. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, and that, you know, that it, that <clears throat> is kind of the wordy thing, but here's how it really happened. Sure. I walked in prison. I was fucking freaked out. I watched American Me before I got there, and mm-hmm. I was just in a panic. Um, I went up, went through A and O, uh, admission and orientation, got uh, issued clothes. I got, and I'm not lying when I tell you this, my underwear that I was issued had stains in them. Oh God! So um, my pants were four inches too big for me it was insane i i mean it was literally the most ridiculous unbelievable thing so i am in a panic inside my mind and i get told to go down to j unit which was right next to a and o and go in there there was a guard on the door his name was revis and ask him to find to tell me where to go get a bunk so i walk down into j unit and buddy, there were bodies swarming everywhere. Terminal Island 
Los Angeles Harbor. It was built for 400, and there were 1,300 of us in there. Wow. So I walked in, and there was this giant guard, Rebus, and he said, just go look in there and come back and tell me where you got found a bed. So I looked down this aisle, and there was a row of 30 bunks outside three tiers of cells. And I ended up with the middle bunk outside a cell that was used for the toilet for all of the people in the bunks outside in the in the aisleway. So as I was walking down to find that bunk, there was an old bookcase off to the side, and there was a piece of paper torn out of an exercise book and a broken piece of pencil just sitting on that next to a Louis L'Amour book and they looked at it and my mind was just going crazy in AA we call it radio station KFUK <laughs> my head was on K fuck and it wouldn't stop everything that could go wrong was going wrong in my mind and I was in such a panic and when I saw that pencil and paper it occurred to me that if I just wrote shit down that was in my head that if I just put it on paper and got it out of me that I wouldn't be as frightened. So I grabbed that piece of paper and that pencil and that's when I started to write was right away that first day. And I wrote every day. And before I left Terminal Island, I'd written over 2,000 pages. Did you get anything beyond paper and pencil once you established that trend or did you just keep accumulating paper and pencil? Or like, did they give you a pen and a notebook? Or? Oh, <laughs> uh, there were typewriters in the law library, but I, uh, which I used, but I found writing by hand, and of course I got pens and paper. Yeah. Uh, you know, once I found my way around that prison, I got everything I wanted. Right. Um, but um, I, I, I preferred to write by hand most of the time, although I did a lot of writing on typewriter because I used to send it out to friends of mine who sent it to a hundred different people who supported me before I went to prison. Right. And it was sort of a, like a newsletter. And it was through that that, you know, that book came eventually right. you were able to <clears throat> crystallize things because what i've noticed is that um from from what happened to me my journey which is completely different from yours but still traumatic <clears throat> what i find is whenever i tell people from a to z how it is it you get different highlights and notes from the same story yeah you know? of course and uh and the more it's burned in you could tell the same story 10 times it comes out differently i mean person could listen to 10 different tellings of the same story and get things because you can't cram it all in you can't remember well, it all and there are angles uh, yeah. depending on the perception of, on 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 your um where your your perspective so you know there are 10 different angles to every story that i have in that book because the, the, all of the people involved i'm sure have different ideas of how those stories were as well sure yeah uh, a friend of mine read the book when it before it was published and he said well i would have and i said well why don't you yeah you know what i mean yeah yeah exactly uh, so because this is my take that's yeah. all there's horrible things that happen to people in prison and there are certain echelons of respect and of course a child uh, abusing sex criminal is the lowest of the low in the world of of prison and there's certain ranks we understand where did you sit in there did, did you garner you're obviously not a pedophile i mean you know did you you're in there for weed did you garner respect did you have an upper echelon were there folks wanting to help you or were there folks giving you a hard time because there was you're a high Terminal flyer. island yeah it was it was in groups terminal island were clicks so there was la familia uh the black gorillas the aryans and us you see when i got popped they popped all of the southeast asia smuggling groups at the same time we all got brought down at wow. the same time so when i ended up in that prison there was a bunch of guys from a bunch of different groups there were like 10 different major southeast asian smugglers yeah they were all locked up in various prisons um, in the federal system in the U.S. So I was in with a bunch of those guys. And, you know, people, uh, so they called us the jet set. <clears throat> right. So we all hung together. Most of us worked at, at, at we all worked for the rec department, the recreation. Um, um, at, but I split off because I, I went to work in the staff training center. Terminal Island was a training ground for staff for the Western Bureau of Prisons in the Western District. Right. So I got a job in there because they had, it was uh, during Desert Storm, and they had a room in there filled with uh, surplus 
uh, five-pound tins of nuts uh, from Desert Storm wow. that were supposed to be given to the prison, to sure. the, all of the prisons, but they were ending up being given to all the guards, and all the guards were going out with nuts every day. Not as a bribe. There was a warehouse full of Twinkies and crap like that all came from Desert Storm that all the guards were scooping. Yeah. They were meant to go to the prisoners. So I got a job in there with a former CIA agent who was, took a fall for the agency, a guy named Ron Rewald. His story is unbelievable. It's in a book called Disavowed, if you ever want to read it. Amazing. amazing Thank story. you for that. Sure. Um, but every day, I'd go in there, and I would. the rec shack was right next to the staff training center. So the moment there were no cops in the vicinity, we'd start offloading all the nuts and all of the right. Twinkies and shit out to the rec center, and all of it would then get distributed to the yard from there. And I would use it to trade for food, basically. You know, I would give you a couple of tins of nuts for a case of fruit. Hmm. Someone in the kitchen. We, you know, you use. use you it you found your way and worked, but you weren't. You weren't. You, you know, subject to any kind of violence or fighting. Oh, or, no, or, or absolutely not. I was backdoor uh, visits. We had no. We were, we were a, a tight group of guys. Uh, you know uh, that we all just hung together, and minded our own business, and that's yeah. just. Listen, you got thirteen hundred <clears throat> people living in a space built for four hundred. In order for that thing not to blow up. You gotta have a lot of tenacity, a lot of perseverance, and a lot of respect for other people's space. Right. You don't touch other people. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, sure. Even though there's fourteen hundred of you, you walk sideways. Right. And you don't rub other people, you don't touch them, you just give everyone as much space as you can give them. Sure. And it in a place where you for, weren't designed to do that. In a place not designed and to for people yeah. who they, you know, are the worst in society. Let me tell you something. I, I there was so much accommodation and human accommodation in that place. People giving space to other people to be whoever they are or whatever they were. Hmm. Uh, that I that I've yet to experience on the outside. So, hmm. you know, it was truly it was, uh, you know, it was one of those great gifts that I would have turned down. What can I say? Oh, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, I yeah. Turned it down. You would have turned it's it down, a gift but that keeps on giving. You've lived it now. Yeah. And the awarenesses that keep coming from it, you know, I keep learning from that experience. But you did wind up there, and at one point, the reason you wound up there is because you had a company of a uh, uh, hundred and twenty or so people, and you were you were had yeah. your pants down with seventy five tons of weed. Mm -hmm. And I also really want to hear the story about how nuts it must have been to be in a, a faulty plane over the Pacific, and and what oh. you might have been carrying at that time, <laughs> and where your mind went, and how you got out of it. Those are two deals that are generation apart but yeah sure in the 70s i had a you know a dc6 uh that we got in a graveyard an old troop carrying plane was a bucket of bolts and um we took off we had a we we leased a an airstrip in a town called moultrie georgia a disused airstrip we used to we uh, leased it from the town of moultrie under the auspices of uh being a mechanic facility for aircraft and they loved it they gave it to us for a dollar um and then we got this plane we took off and had problems halfway down and um we lost all of our hydraulics basically and the pilot turned to me and he said do you want to crash in the u.s or columbia <laughs> So anyway, we went back to the U.S., and I got back in the back of the plane, started pouring hydraulic fluid into the system when we dropped the nose, the, the landing gear down, hoping right. that there would be enough fluid in the system to make it bust pressure open. so right. it would lock it open, and it worked. Oh, wow. So it took us a day to fix the plane. We took off down there again, and when we landed down in Colombia and Rio Hacha and the Wajira Peninsula, um, we... Uh, lost the nose gear steering, went off the runway. Anyway, between the jigs and the reels, we lost one of the motors. But the mechanic who helped us said that we could make it back with three motors. So we put 16,000 pounds on it and took off. And wow. two minutes later, we were in the ocean. Gosh. Now, so, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to give away a trade secret, and I'm not yeah. going to ask to, to, to invade your privacy, but we are talking about a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious in the mechanics of how it works 
that some white Canadian guy from up in Newfoundland uh, is now down in Colombia brokering. Like, how do you even do that? Not like I'm going to, but I'm just fascinated. Because no. if I know, if you said to me, okay, listen, you we need some weed, I wouldn't be able to do it. Well, you couldn't do it today. But anyway. I wouldn't know how to do it even well, in your time. Well, I didn't either. You know, I, I, I got out of prison in 72, and I had nothing, and and I had... Uh, a ticket, uh, I bought a ticket to Columbia and I had $500 and I had a card with a guy's name and an address of a restaurant where I could go and ask the owner of the restaurant to find this guy. Oh, wow. Okay? And I couldn't speak Spanish. <laughs> and that's what uh, I did. A friend of mine picked me up at the prison when I got out of prison in 72 in Newfoundland at, at Her Majesty's <clears throat> Penitentiary. Oh, yeah. Uh, we had no toilets or running water in there, no phone calls, one visit every two weeks. It was bizarre. Well, that's because Her Majesty herself never yeah. goes. You know, that's the problem. And uh, so I took off and went down to Columbia, and that's, you know, with uh-huh. 500 bucks in my pocket, and I just started. Um, so that I deal worked, going. obviously. That, that yeah, You that did was find the guy. Coke in my hand that I walked through customs, and the next was the Coke in the suitcase, wow. and the next was I got a boat. I had a ship, a 100-foot Baltic trader down in uh, the Caribbean that For we weed. got in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. And we brought it down there to get weed. Wow. And we lost a few loads, and then I got the plane. And that's when I dropped the plane. And then, you know, I fooled around for years, just, you know, middling and doing stuff like that, and then started to do some deals out of Southeast Asia with some friends of mine. And and finally, we organized a 75-ton buy from the Vietnamese military. Wow. And uh, we brought it over in two distinct loads that were a year apart. And we brought the first load in, and the second part... They were watching us the entire time. And the day before we were going to bring it down and offload it, we found out that they were on us. Mm. So with that information, um, basically, uh, this is what saved us. We knew that they knew, but they didn't know that we knew they knew. That's a good defense. So we orchestrated something for them to look at, which they did. Wow. And while we had the retention, we came in another door. And uh, we offloaded everything. And finally, when we orchestrated for them to hit our boats, there was the scent of fresh donuts, which had just been taken off the fryer, and coffee. And not a joint, not a cigarette paper, nothing. And we had three big ships, a 100-footer, a 160-footer, and a 58-footer. And there was nothing but the smell of coffee and donuts. Wow, that's the best. And they flipped out. And so while we didn't get busted, I knew... I thought they would have liked the donuts, at least. Yeah. Well, I, I knew that, you know, eventually we're going to hear about this. And sure enough, three years later, right. the hammer fell. They, they they carry a personal vengeance into their job. Well, I don't point, blame right? them for that. I mean, that was real huge egg on their face. And I knew that, you know, we're going to be thrilled for this at a certain point. And sure enough, we were... There's a book out called Jackpot that features Barry Foy and a lot of his cohorts in the Carolinas who in the 70s basically did the same journey you were doing right. all the time they around the They were doing the it out of Columbia. Yeah, and Lebanon and other places right. and, and on on that coast up and down. And and so uh, what, what I heard from them, uh, they, they all to a man uh, were happy with the, the jail term they got vis-a-vis the money they got later and they all felt good about doing it they all knew at the time although we didn't know cbds and thc and all that kind of stuff that their their clientele were just basically good folks Mm -hmm. who were reporting back that they did so feel better using this stuff and and they had a thing i want to ask you that basically the gentleman smugglers you get caught with whatever no guns hands up yes sir no sir were you like that too or were you packing we did $250 million in that last load, and there wasn't a gun, but on not one of us had a gun. Wow. What would have happened? $250 had, had million. And, like, I would up. go to New York, um, drive down in my motor home into the uh, um, fashion district in New York. Stranger would be standing on a corner. I would know it was him, the suitcases, and a glove in one hand. And I'd just pull up on the corner. I'd open the door, the motor home. 
This guy would get in with the suitcases, drop the suitcases off, shake my hand, and go, and there'd be $10 million there. Wow. And I'd never see the guy before or after. Wow. And, you know, that's how it was done. And we did $250 million that way and didn't lose a dime. Right. And didn't have a gun. So if the cops walked in and, and caught you red paint, you'd be they just did. like, yeah, When they okay. arrested me, the first thing they said was, do you have a gun? And I said, you're the one with the gun. Right. And then all of a sudden there were eight of them with guns. Yeah. But. Yeah. <laughs> That's that amazing. Another day. That's another day. So, where do you see uh, where do you see yourself now? You were in trouble a long time ago. Did your time in the states, and uh-huh. now you you reside in Canada, and you've yeah. you've you've become um, you've taken a lot of this history and knowledge, and, and you rolled out a bit of a career for yourself in television. Mm-hmm. Uh, when did that start, and what w- what were you the kinds of things you were doing? I know about the show Redemption on CBC, but you you were well in the uh, in the nineties, uh, uh, two thousand one. My wife said to me one day, you got to get a job because I'd been losing money on the stock market and, you know, I'd never had a job. Mm. And I said, get a job? Who the fuck's going to hire me? Right. And she said, oh, you why? You can't do anything? I said, well, I've never had a job. She said, let's see. You had 110 guys working with you in secret. You did $250 million worth of business in secret. You had trucking companies, shipping companies. You had cell phones before anyone had cell phones. And you know how to do anything, really. Right. Sit down and write a resume. And so I sat down and I wrote like a resume and I went oh fuck right I'm going down to Midland Wall and getting a job as a stockbroker with this resume yeah yeah but it occurred to me when I wrote it hey I, I could put this as an ad in the paper I think I'll do that so I wrote this ad and the ad was headlined former marijuana smuggler having recently completed a 10 year sentence for importing 75 tons of marijuana into the United States I now seek a legal means of employment to support my family I'm an expert in logistics. I'm a technical expert. I speak three languages, and I listed attributes, and then I listed um, for personal references uh, the district attorney who prosecuted me and a few other people. And even though I didn't cooperate, and I was one of two guys in 55 of us that got indicted that didn't cooperate, this guy loved me for not talking figure that one out uh, so i'm trying but you're still uh, yeah, talking you that's go. bizarre so i i put that i <clears throat> i called the globe and mail and i i i explained the ad to them and they eventually refused to run it they didn't run it and they wouldn't run it why not that's a great and, ad. and they wouldn't they wouldn't even talk to me about it so <laughs> i called the national post and um uh, i said i'd like to run an ad on page three right in the middle of the page i want a four by two inch ad how much? They said 1300 bucks. I said, okay, I'm going to fax you over the copy. Send me back a blue line. I'll approve it, and we'll go. And they said, okay, nice. fair enough. So I faxed them over a copy for the ad. You know my phone rang 30 seconds later. Right. <laughs> Brian, uh, look, can I make a suggestion? And I said, yeah, go for it. He said, listen, for $1,300... We'll run that ad every day for a week in the financial post wow. in the classified section. Yeah. Or you can have the one shot for 1300 in the middle in the of page three. Right. He said, but I'm going to tell you, you could put that ad in the last corner of the last page of this paper. I guarantee you, you are going to get Nothing. a million responses. A million of responses. Okay, That's but they're going to be funny ones, so, too, I'm sure. Some of them. Uh, the ad had you had to write by mail and put a stamp on an envelope there was no email attached it sure. was just you had to write the post office box at the national post well man i got 600 responses from all over the world wow and every police agency in the united states offered me a job are I you mean, serious oh yeah what as I, what a drug recognition expert yeah talk you know consulting. all these names <laughs> Uh, just, you know, smugglers, organ smugglers. It was bizarre, the number of, of job offers. Organ smugglers. Organ smugglers, yeah. Offered you a job yeah. because you used to do because pot. Was a smuggler. Uh, how, what would you do? Be smuggling organs? Yeah. What kind? Like Hammond, B3? What are we no, talking about? No, we're talking Leslie? about kidneys. And, oh, I know. I was kidding because I, I don't want to hear this. Yeah. What, what do you mean? Uh, these are people who would make deals for organs 
to be bought from poor people and sold to rich people, basically. Americans? Uh, yeah, this guy was an American. He, the guy I, I turned that guy's letter over to the National Post, to Charlie Gillis, who wrote the story on yeah. me. And, geez, the next week they did a whole expose on organ smuggling. Wow. Anyway, um, so I, the responses came from all over the world, and, and one of the things that happened was I got invited to be a guest on a late night talk show on which I met an actor and that actor introduced me to these other people and geez before you know it I was producing a television show called Creepy Canada and I was the one with the money so I could back the thing it, it, it ultimately cost me a quarter of a million bucks I had bad partners they stole my money and you know I kind of put it down to um getting a PhD in the television business and that's what it cost me yeah and then some years later I, I did that thing with Kevin O'Leary um, I did uh, how to make money selling drugs with Matthew Cook that was a lot of fun uh, and if you haven't seen that film you really must see it it's what's it called how to make money selling drugs it is an extraordinary documentary and uh, we launched it at TIFF um, got a distribution deal with Tribeca, and it did very well. That's great. So do you have current uh, television plans, or, or, or what are you involved it's in at the moment? Before I came here, I got a call from a guy. These people are asking me to help them put this TV show together in L.A. That I, I came up with the idea, and I got a bite on it, and then I decided, you know what, I don't want to do this business anymore, so I stopped. Um, some friends of mine in the business want to take that show and, and the contacts that I made to do the show in L.A. and So I'll probably turn them on to it. I'm not interested in the TV business anymore. I'm interested in the hemp business. Okay. And uh, I'm in the hemp business in Columbia. have a hemp farm. Um, and um, we're planting 1,000 acres in January. Is it in the north or south of Columbia, or are you not able to say? It's in Cali. Okay. It's right it's on the equator. Of, right, yeah. Right, it's sort of the middle, isn't it? Where, Pardon? Is it the middle of Colombia? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah it's perfect. It's mm -hmm. uh it we get 13 hours a day of sun. We get three crops a year. It uh and the yield uh CBD yield is 2 to two and a half times greater than the US. Wow. So, you know, it takes a, an acre of property growing hemp gives it over six times the value of a US acre of hemp. Wow. Because three yields a year and two to two and a half times the CBD yield. And good sun because you're up in the, you're on the line. You're just on the equator, so you have sun all day, every Now, day. do you experience any kinds of um, difficulties uh, in Colombia doing what you do? Uh, is it legal what you're doing? I guess Hemp it is. is yeah. legal, Hemp is legal. Hemp is legal. Hemp is legal. So you experience no trouble vis-a-vis -vis the Medellin cartel of, oh, of no, all that, of that stuff. That, it, it's not like that in Colombia anymore. They don't have the Medellin cartel? Not like that. It's, no. I'm sure there are people, you know, there's still cocaine in the world. There's still heroin in the world. Right. Uh, it still comes from down there. Uh, I'm sure there are people doing it, but it's not like the days of Pablo Escobar and uh, uh, cartels and the threats and, the, and the, the, the crazy society. It's not like that anymore. Since they um, put the peace deal together, uh, Colombia has become a, a really the country that I have always known it to be, which is an awesome country filled with extraordinary, beautiful people, mm -hmm. and uh, just gorgeous. I, I just love Colombia. There was a, I was there eighteen months ago, and there was a fa or, oh, not quite, but um, I, I really noticed uh, something funny coming in from the Bogota airport into Bogota. It's so great. It's so easy. There's no traffic, even though it's busy. The way they design the roads, and there's this bike path down the middle that's grass swath. It's fantastic. But what I noticed is there's a lot of defacing, and uh, they obviously get away with it of the conquerors that came over. They're not fans of uh, having been imperialized through evasion, and all of these uh, statues of the great Europeans are so wildly defaced that you know no one's bothering to do anything about it. They just right. they just destroy their statues and leave them there instead of here. They want to take them down. You know. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty yeah, funny they, to me. They, uh, I, you know, I I I never had uh, too many problems in Colombia. I had some issues down there. I yeah, got held up by the cops one time, but uh, you know, it just took money to fix it. Yeah. And and that probably wouldn't happen today. Yeah, no, it's it's a different scene. I mean, you're coming. And from I'm a, a seventy-year-old white guy. Yeah, yeah, I'm invisible. 
You know right. what I mean? Sure. Not a seventy-year-old one. You you learn the older you get, the more invisible you become. Yeah. And you know, I could hop in a little car and drive down the street and never be noticed for the rest of my life. Yeah. And that's, that's a kind of a nice thing to kind know. Of a nice that thing, I especially where you've been. Place. Yeah. 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 And so this hemp business of yours, you're you're just uh, manufacturing it, and people are buying it. Uh, do you have any interests uh, in in companies that actually create hemp products we do you, that you do that what we do you do what that. do you have we we uh create cbd products our okay. whole thing with hemp is to extract the cbd cbg cbn uh-huh. thcv and so on uh, isolate all of the products and also create full spectrum oil from the hemp um wow and our primary uh focus is on our european clients who buy kilos in you know the hundreds and thousands of kilos um, and then we have a white label company that we make. Uh, we, well, we have our own company. We make our own CBD products. We have 180 SKUs right now. Wow. Uh, every kind of product you can think of. I'm, I'm including suppositories, for heaven's sake. They're oh, called great. rocket ships. And uh, it's CBD suppositories. Um, but, you know, basically anything you can do with CBD, we're doing it. And well, now the new one is CBG is where the, a lot of the focus is going. CBG is uh, they're experiencing practically instant relief from heroin addiction, uh, anxiety, uh, extreme anxiety relief. Um, and, you know, whereas CBD is between five and 7,000 U.S. a kilo, CBG is 80,000 a kilo right now. Wow. Now That's one of the cannabinoids I, that's been isolated. Yes. This is kicking the door open and it's quick yes so that's going to be contributing towards your turnaround if you're doing a full spectrum oil because that's in there someplace yes right but, but if you, you're doing if you isolate cbg you'll get a greater response for extreme anxiety and addictions is anyone selling that because we yeah, don't hear about you can now get CBG. some products with cbg in it in the u.s i've seen it in uh, colorado and california um but it's extremely expensive. Well, how about this then? Let me bounce this number off of you. There, uh, in in a long uh, twenty years or so or more, perhaps there's a company in England called GW Pharmaceuticals. Uh, uh-huh. They've been um, researching and growing cannabis for medicinal purposes for quite some time. While the British government's been saying there's no benefit to this, shut up, get away. So they've had this sort of vacuum to develop over over the years and and it's still a different scene in england now it's nowhere near as accessible as we have it here however gw pharmaceuticals is releasing a fantastic medicine that is supposed to help you um and and it's thirty three thousand dollars a year to get this prescription or you would have to pay that or work it through your insurance so you're paying less than that hopefully but Thirty-three thousand dollars. Are they saying it's for, good for, it. for CBD um, to yeah. to turn it into a drug, and and it'll be licensed, and it's okay, mm-hmm. and the FDA is cool with it, and right. so is the British government. It's thirty-three thousand uh-huh. dollars a year for a decent supply of CBDs when you could probably do that at home with some plants for a few hundred bucks or a grand, right, for the year or something like that. Well, you if you could get your hands on a high CBD yielding marijuana plant, like hemp yields CBD. The average industrial hemp uh, yields 10 to 12 percent. But there are marijuana plants that have been bred to produce less than 1 percent THC, but 35 percent CBD. Wow. Um, And, you know, that's exceptional product. Look, the markup in CBD is monstrous. Let me just give you an example. Sure. A bottle of CBD water that costs five bucks. It's got 10 milligrams of CBD in it. Well, one gram will give you a hundred of those bottles. Okay, wow, that's five hundred dollars <laughs> for one gram. If you're paying seven thousand dollars for a kilo, that gram costs you seven dollars. Yeah, so you're getting the markup is extraordinary. The creams that cost fifty, sixty bucks got you know five bucks wow. worth of CBD in them, maybe, maybe less. So the markup's extraordinary. We're trying to affect that with our product line. Yeah. Um, 
And then CBG, well, very few people are isolating CBG is the issue. Uh, and, because you know, it's so new to, to the awareness that it's so fantastic? The awareness of its impact is new, yeah. and it occurs much less frequently in the plant than CBD. So, uh, you know, your yield is probably 1% to 2%, and you still have to put it through an extraction process the same as you do if you're extracting CBD. So because you get so much less, the price is higher. But, you know, we have the extraction equipment, and we are, you know, we have the ability to extract 200 liters of isolate a day, which wow. is 200 kilos of CBD a day. And because this is brand new to me, and I'm listening to everything you're saying, but can you just rewind a bit and, and tell us what exactly is so fantastic about CBG, and what is it good for, specifically? Well, CBD is supposedly the best anti-inflammatory in existence. Right. That's... That we know. Oh, I come from a school, and um, as do many people that I know, that all disease is one thing only. It's inflammation um, brought about by something or another, but it's, it surfaces as inflammation. Mm -hmm. So we deal with the inflammation. We have a chance of getting at the disease. That's where CBD comes in. CBG is helpful for anxiety, uh, instantly helpful for anxiety, and as is CBD. Um and uh, addictions. So I'll give you an example. I had a bottle of nanoized CBD. So nanoized means the micron is between 35 and 50 microns. When you make CBD that small, the particles that small, you don't need the liver to interpret it to get it to the rest of the body. It is immediately it's absorbed right in, in the bloodstream, okay? So we were out on the boat one day in Colorado with some friends, and a friend of mine was there, young man in his 30s. He doesn't smoke pot. And the guys on the boat were smoking this vaporizer little machine that they were vaping shatter or some such thing, right? And uh, my friend took a puff of this thing. Well, in about 20 seconds, he was up in the front of the boat in a total panic, hiding, having anxiety, <laughs> wow. just tremendous you know huh. it affected him tremendously i took my little vial of nanoized cbd out of my pocket little eyedropper thing and i put an eyedropper full under his tongue and in 30 seconds he was back wow. really that quickly he was okay That's amazing. i'm better um so you know there's uh people end up in in emergency rooms and hospitals um f for marijuana because of one reason only that's consuming it by eating it of one you know instead of smoking it right. putting ingesting it in one way or another um the problem with that is the moment that hits your liver it becomes four to five times as powerful as smoking it it c converts this thc into thc delta nine something or tetrahydrocannabinol some cannabidiol something yeah. happens with the liver that causes it to be way more potent way more effective um, and so all of the emergency room calls are over this. Our plan is to create this product that will be in all emergency rooms, in every cop car, in every uh, ambulance, this little product mm -hmm. that given instantly will reduce that anxiety mm. and take care of a huge expense that emergency rooms are going through and they don't know what to do with these people other than give them Valium. Right. And right. doesn't solve the in, issue. Intervenous in your... Valium. That, that's really good. Probably get hooked on that and need another yeah. drug to help you get off of that hook. Do you know that more people die kicking Valium than any other drug? Really? I yeah. did not know that. Yeah. That is a fact. They feel it from overdose. They take a little more. No. Than... People get hooked on Valium just taking one a day, buddy. Wow. The, just the withdrawal from it is immense. I have no idea why. Huh. But that's. I worked in a drug rehab for a couple of years. Actually, I was working in a drug rehab when the cops showed up and I got indicted and got 10 years. But uh, that's where I learned that particular factoid. factoid yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. So you're never going back to prison because you're involved in a legal uh, venture, this hemp industry, but it's, it's really, uh, it's amazing, isn't it, how fast people are starting to understand uh, these healthful properties. Uh, to me, I need there to be some kind of reckoning for the people who have been so forcefully preventing access to this, I'm very disappointed that in the United States, in various pockets here and there, uh, 
they have uh, on Canada's behalf. I'm disappointed that in so many of the American areas, they do have these recompense programs. Like, hey, you went to jail, you did all okay. this. Now we're going to bring in the business. They don't even address that here. My son-in-law in Los Angeles, Anthony Turner. Um, Anthony's involved in social justice and basically Prop 64. What is Prop 64? Prop 64 is a repatriation of people with criminal records to get all of these records expunged. Uh, Anthony shows up on weekends in uh, various locations in L.A. with 30, 40 lawyers, and they just see pe- one person after another, hundreds of people every day. Mm-hmm. They announce that they're coming, <laughs> and uh, their whole thing is expunging criminal records for people. In Los Angeles, uh, Mayor Garcetti, a wonderful guy, um, he has two pet projects. One is called Rebuild L.A. L.A. used to be a manufacturing center. Well, all that manufacturing is gone, but all those empty buildings are there. And mm-hmm. the mayor is looking for creative ideas for those buildings. Hmm. And um, they will supply the real estate if you come up with the creative idea that they like. Right. And then the second pet project is the reentry project. And there are fifty-five to 60,000 people walking the streets of L.A. with criminal records that can't get jobs. The mayor wants those people to be brought back into society. The ergo, Prop 64, all of the work being done on Prop 64, all of the lawyers showing up to expunge criminal records, that's to help these people get back in. Right. And um, my son-in-law has done a lot of good work in that regard. We're working on a project in L.A. that is going to benefit those two particular pet projects of the mayor. Yeah. We're working on a... Well, it's refreshing to hear someone at that level of power is wielding it correctly. I and that guy keep... wants to be the next president of the United States. Wow. What's his name? Garcetti. 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 Because our mayor in Toronto, he's got a bit of an opposite take. What he wants to do instead is he doesn't like all of the um, the circus and, and, and the danger that goes on in front of a dispensary when someone goes into it to buy something. Uh, so they authorize these... Um, police busts that are far more uh, of a scene on the street than someone going into a store. And the other plan, I'm sure that if we had those same buildings here, this mayor would, instead of turning them into projects, would uh, drop them to the floor and put up condos. Yeah. Uh, that's what well, we're going to do here. You know, they they say we have more cranes in the sky in Toronto than all of North America combined. There wow. are over 168 cranes in the sky here. Yeah. And the rest of North America put together doesn't have that many cranes. Well, maybe the rest of North America doesn't want a phenomenally expensive condo 25 feet away from a major highway that is a big... You know, you're sitting there looking at a parking lot for four hours a day because yep. you can't get around this city. Yep. Um, yeah, so just to clarify, if, you, if anybody was listening, it was GW Pharmaceuticals with the uh, Epidiolex. This is in, uh, uh, England. in England, right? And and the purpose of this drug is, is a... Um, uh, um, what am I saying here? A spasm prevention, uh, an epilepsy yeah. drug. So an epilepsy you know drug. We have Charlotte's Web, and that's been doing that forever. Is that thirty-three thousand a year? To- no, Charlotte's Web is you know hemp uh, oil basically. Yeah. Uh, same as Phoenix Tears, Rick Simpson oil. Same thing. Yeah. I mean, families are moving to Colorado just to be able to take CBD because it kills those seizures. Uh, and so here's this company. You know, it's going to cost you thirty grand a year. Of course, they're a pharmaceutical company. We have, um, I'm, I'm a part of a group that has formulations that have been worked on for the past 50 years um, that we will be releasing next year. You'll hear a lot about these formulations. I'm not going to tell you what they are right now because I'm bound to secrecy. Sure. But, uh, and one company recently paid $50 million for the rights to these formulations for a very small area. Um, and we have those for the rest of the world for CBD and CBG and so on. Mm. So I'm very excited to tell you that in you know in about a year's time you're going to see a whole lot of new products on the market uh, through these formulations that are not available today. Great. And that's going to be you're involved with that greatly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's they will be in exciting. all of our white label products these formulations. Okay. And um you you have uh, your son is is in America. Four, I have four kids in the U.S. They're two all sons in the U.S. And two daughters. Mm-hmm. They're born there. Mm-hmm. So they're they're are well. They... One son was born here. Okay, but he's an American as well. Okay, so he lives in Santa Barbara. Is that a problem for you, having done time in in America? And I have a you're... waiver. You have a waiver. Mm-hmm. Ah, I see. Took a long time to get it, uh, but I finally got it, and now I go back and forth. You know, every couple of weeks, I'm wow back down there. 
And and do they uh, look at you strangely? I mean, mm-hmm. we're told I can't smoke a joint and cross the but you've done time over there. You can mm-hmm. cross? Like, what's the condition for the waiver? Um, just, you know, I had to fill out this application and, you know, do drug tests and all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, eventually, after 10 years, they gave it to me. Wow. And so uh, uh, the first five waivers I got for were, were for one year. And the last waiver I got was for five years. That's a card you flash when you cross over? It's a letter. It's two big sheets of paper I have to give the customs guy. And, you know, it, it, it's a procedure. It's yeah. It's not, you know, I don't get waved through. Let me say that. And they're not sticky with you? Or you don't get waved through. So are they sticky with you in that you're involved with CBDs in, in no, Colombia? No, I don't talk to about that. You don't I don't. I got yeah. nothing to do. Listen. I go to the United States for one reason only. See your children. See my kids. Yeah, yeah. That's and, it. And was there, it must have been brutal doing uh, this hard time for a long time and not seeing your children. I mean, mm-hmm. that's an obvious statement, but um, can you mm-hmm. speak to that at all? I mean, did that change your it's wiring another, at all? It's another part of the price that the government has exacted on on people who displease them because i've been hearing a lot about you know taking kids away uh, folks coming in and everyone's upset that the president would remove uh, but this has been going on for different reasons forever it's sure yeah yeah it's a bit of a displaced focus a a pr focus well listen brian o'day i this is the worst part of an interview such as this is that you know we have to wrap it up it's it's after four o'clock we oh my goodness me we've had a i I mean i could go on for another two or three hours but we aren't able to do that with the facilities i'd love to have you back sometime if you're busy uh, any place in the states we we would uh, happily do a phone call skype if you have any news if you get the news about the formulations that you're not allowed to share now and you're at the ready stage. We'd love to hear all about uh, it. I definitely will tell you. That's amazing. And, um, you know, we're doing, a, we have a line that we're doing specifically for vets called CanOps. And, uh, CanOps. CanOps. And, and w- tell us about that because there's such a great um, support for the vets. We've had the Veterans Channel on. A lot of people are focused on this. Right. We, we, uh, we have a great interest in vets. And, um, we're talking former military, military folks, veterans, not, not animal yeah, doctors. That are not getting uh, the help that they need. And a lot of them have been finding they get a lot of help from cannabis and from CBD. So we've created a line of CBD products. They're in the process of creating a line of CBD products called CanOps that will be aimed directly at the veteran community. Well, that sounds and good. Reasonably priced for it. It sounds well. like the private world is uh, certainly providing far more relief and a landing pad for these folks than the the, the the dudes that sent them over there. Yeah, and you know we we try and make it as as inexpensive for the vets as possible, and that's the whole deal. That's the idea. Um, I'm certainly a, a, a fan. I will be reading this. I, I just came across you a while ago, and I uh, didn't have time Thank to cram you. it in. But what an amazing book! Uh, this is get by high. all reports get high yeah. at the bookstore yeah. <laughs> are you allowed to say that yeah. Yeah. hey listen if you're a, if you're a cop and uh, you're going to be uh, taking care of people at the side of the road with a Draeger 5000 um, you're, what you're going to want to do I think it's necessary that we're going to have to lobby and we're going to have to try to make sure that uh, you got to do a Draeger test at the beginning of your police constable shift. And since you're out there in the dangerous cannabis during your shift where something might happen to you, I think you're going to need a test at the end of your shift as well. Uh, they're $20 each, every cop before his shift, every cop after his shift. Write your MP. Ask them why it is that there are very good pieces of information and, and, and uh, leads that, that say that Canada has somehow swung a deal with Jamaica. To get $100 a pound, and of course, they're still going to sell it as, as high a rate as if they were the black market while they tried to pretend to squish the black market that they are actually creating for themselves. It's all about perception, folks, and everything's going to be fine. 